This happened almost a decade ago, when I was 13 years old. I remember my friend and I were excited about our first time trick-or-treating without our parents. We lived in a small town where nothing ever happens, and we thought it would be the same that night. It started like any other Halloween night. We collected candy, ran into many of our classmates, and had a lot of fun. At 8pm, we realised we had to head home, but on the way back, we dropped by our teacher's house. She wasn't home, and the street didn't have many streetlights. To add to this, most of the houses had their lights turned off, and the Halloween decorations were taken down. My friend and I were slightly spooked and disappointed by the lack of candy. We wanted to get out of the street as soon as possible. That's when a man emerged from under one of the few streetlights. It was a police officer. Neither of us seemed to notice him before this, possibly due to the darkness. He startled us, but seemed very friendly. The cop introduced himself and pointed to an inconspicuous bungalow. He said an old man living in this house was inviting trick-or-treaters inside. Someone called the police, but when he arrived, no one was answering the door. He kept telling us his police car and partner were just around the block. We looked around, but couldn't see them. I was a pretty paranoid kid growing up. My mum loved watching crime shows, and she'd always tell me the tidbits of lessons. One of these was a story about fake cops. Although I don't remember the details, I remembered people can pretend to be police officers to gain trust. Throughout this whole exchange, I was terrified. His lack of badge, police car and partner did not feel right. I was also conflicted because he was smiling and seemed like he just wanted to help. That was until we heard his strange request. He said he needed to speak to this potential predator and needed our help. Since we were young girls, the man would answer if we knocked. The officer claimed he would hide behind the bushes next to the front door. He would wait for him to invite us in, jump out and catch him red-handed. At that moment, I knew my friend felt the same way I did. We both fell silent, but one of us managed to ask if we could talk amongst ourselves. The cop said yes, but told us we had limited time. The street was silent and he could hear everything. I remember the feeling of wanting to say something, but fearing he would hear us and escalate the situation. We just stared at each other for what felt like forever. The cop was getting increasingly impatient and told us we had to decide quickly. Around that moment, a family came down the street and noticed the officer. They were coming over to see what was happening. That's when the cop said he'd be right back and not to go anywhere. My friend and I scrambled to collect our thoughts and decided to run away. We sprinted out of the street and didn't look back. On our way home, we discussed theories that ranged from him being a fake cop, him playing a prank on us, or him being a real cop, but we misunderstood the situation. When we told our parents, we downplayed it a lot and doubted our experience. In the end, we didn't call the police, but our dads drove to the house and area around the house. No cop cars or police officers were in sight. Over the years, I can say I regret not calling the police. At the time, my friend and I were convinced we misunderstood what happened. We even told our class the next day, and most, including our teacher, thought it wasn't alarming. Looking back, I find it extremely strange a police officer would put two children in such a potentially dangerous situation. I wonder what his motives were, but it will forever, unfortunately, remain unsolved. So this happened on Halloween when I was about 11. My friend and I decided to go trick-or-treating. Yeah, we're a little old, but just wanted some free candy. I lived in a very nice neighbourhood, one of those ones where everyone gives out the full-size candy bars, so it wasn't unusual to have a lot of people come there to trick-or-treat. However, that also meant that there's about an acre of front yard for each house, so it took about three minutes to walk between each door. It was a good night for Halloween weather-wise, not too chilly, not rainy or anything. This is important later. So it's approaching 8.30pm. And after hanging around on the golf course and appreciating our candy haul, we decide to start heading home and call it a night. The street I live on is a gigantic U-shape, 
like a little over half a mile walk from the top of the U down the bend to the other side. We were walking towards the end of the U, further from my house, as we wanted to take the long way because it was such a nice night out. It's about 9pm now, so no one else is really out anymore at this point, and people turn off their porch lights, the universal signal for no more trick-or-treaters. That's when we notice a lone white van parked on the street. We made a joke about how it looks like one of those stereotypical kidnap vans with the painted windows. That's when we notice it shift out of park and slowly creep down the street towards us and park at the next house. They must have kids trick-or-treating. It wasn't uncommon for people to drive their kids from house to house since they were so spread out in our neighbourhood. But given that it was 9pm and a night with nice weather, it struck us as a bit odd. We checked every few minutes and it seemed to be just stopping from house to house like normal. We turned around again and kept walking at a leisurely pace, gossiping and whatnot. That's when we hear the car squeal as it moved forward down the hill and park again. This time, only about two houses away from us, on the opposite side of the street. Again, weird time to trick a treat, but whatever. That's when we realised there were no kids getting out of the van. Not once. Now this was before my first phone. Since it was only 2008, we were about 15 minutes from my house, but a bit disturbed. So we walked to the nearest door, rang the bell, and stuck our bags out in an attempt to act normal. A woman opens the door just a crack and proceeds to berate us for trick-or-treating at a late hour and slams the door before we could even say a word. Okay, thanks lady. We turn around and the van is right there, parked in the wrong direction on our side of the street. The windows are tinted, so we can't even see the guy driving. Trying to keep our cool, we casually walk away from the door and up the street into this cul-de-sac loop that's on the side of the street that makes up the bigger U. If you cut through that loop and hop a couple fences, you can end up at my back door. The van goes the same way. Now we know he's following us since there's no reason for him to go up this side street otherwise. We break into a sprint and I am by no means athletic, but I hop those fences like I was an Olympian. We run inside my house, lock all the doors and freak out while we sit in the front hall. Not five minutes later, the van slowly drives down the street past my house. We stress eat our candy and think of what could have happened if we hadn't been aware of our surroundings. The OP of the following story is still haunted by this to this day. It just goes to show you how seemingly fun and innocent decisions made when you're a kid can put you in danger. This happened on Halloween night. I was a freshman in high school. My friends and I weren't quite at the point in high school where we would have any sort of Halloween party to go to, and we were way too cool to go trick-or-treating, obviously. We were a tight-knit group of five girls. We'd grown up together since we were babies and lived in a small rural town outside of city limits. To set the scene, this is a very remote, woodsy area. One of our friends, let's call her T, her parents raised chickens and had about 50 acres filled with chicken houses, which we would explore on her four-wheeler after school quite often. The build-up to this night was filled with adrenaline and methodical planning. In our small town, one of the more thrill-seeking activities to do was what we call rolling yards. If you're not from a southern or rural area, this is basically throwing rolls of toilet paper up into trees so that streams of toilet paper hang down. Classic prank, rolling yards. Had a crush on a guy from class, rolling yards. Girl drama revenge, rolling yards. It's hard to explain the kind of adrenaline that you get sneaking down a rural two lane road in the pitch black, turning down a long gravel driveway, threatening the group's lives if they make a sound. If you get caught, your parents find out and maybe worse, you were stuck cleaning up the mess the next day. So my friends and I decided the two weeks prior to this night that we were going to go on a Halloween rampage. And specifically, we were going to roll the creepy house right down the rural road my friend T lived on. This house had been a big scare story 
between my friend and I for years. We would go on afternoon walks after school and pass by often. No one ever came in or out of the house. But T's parents told us that a man lived there and that he was a bit of a creep. She gave a strict warning to stay away from the area. T's mum worked in law enforcement and she probably knew much more sinister reasons for us to stay away than she told us at the time. The night would go as such. T's older sister, B, who was 17 at the time, would drive us to the local Walmart after T's mum and dad went to bed. B was the kind of cool older sister who was in on our shenanigans and thought it was fun to chaperone us whenever we were doing crazy things. All five of us loaded up into the back seat of B's car, piling onto each other's laps, blaring our favourite 2000s hip-hop songs and flying down the two-lane curvy road. A scary thought in of itself at this point in my life, but nothing happened. Thank goodness. We park in the near empty parking lot of the store around 11.30pm and made our way towards the toilet paper aisle, hyped up on pure adrenaline. We filled two shopping carts completely full of the 99 cent rolls of toilet paper, snickering to ourselves as the clerk eyed us suspiciously or checking us out. We ran giddy back to B's car, popped the trunk and threw the loads of toilet paper into the trunk. On the way back towards T's town, out of city limits, we turned down the music to discuss the play-by-play of our attack. B would park down a dirt road that led to some cow pastures about a mile from the man's, we'll call him Mr S, his driveway to wait on us. The five of us would split up into teams, walking along the edge of the woods by the road quietly, just in case a car would pass. This would make it easy for us to drop down to the ground and hide. We filled our arms full of rolls of toilet paper and headed toward the long gravel road of Mr S's house. The adrenaline practically beating out of my eardrums. The crickets in the background screeching in synchronicity. We make about 10 yards from the entrance of the driveway and unload the toilet paper we had carried, then quietly made our way back towards B's trunk to get the next load of toilet paper. Once all the toilet paper was piled into our checkpoint, at the edge of the woods by the entrance, we each grabbed four rolls and went into the woods along each side of the gravel driveway to creep towards the house, all whispering to each other to shut up, shh, dude, shut up. We're gonna get caught if you don't stop, shh. We finally see the faint light coming from the side of the house by Mr. S's garage. And it was the most terrified I'd ever been. Not only was the house 1,000% creepier in this moment than when we walked past it during the day, but the thought of getting caught by the man we were specifically told to stay away from was nauseating. T was definitely the bravest and most rambunctious of the bunch. She decides to make a beeline towards the garage while walking through the edge of the woods, and we watched her in pure shock. She stood near the woods, peeking out, and motioned for us to make our move, confirming that no lights in the house were on, and Mr S was 99% likely asleep inside. I stood frozen, scared. I would pee my pants if I moved, but was ushered along by another girl who pointed to the tall oak tree at the very front of Mr S's house, which was the worst location imaginable. I decided my teammates were worth it, and I ripped open a pack of toilet paper and hurled it up towards the sky, towards the highest branch on the tree, watching the stream of white paper fly down and catch the wind. Soon, streams of white were falling out of every tree surrounding the house, and we were getting very cocky and even more fearless the longer we attacked. All of a sudden, my friend T stopped dead in her tracks and made a loud hush noise. I stopped, hiding behind a tree, my heart literally in my throat as I now saw what looked like lights turning on from inside the house. Out of the corner of my eye, T then whisper yelled, RUN! And we dropped our remaining rolls of toilet paper and began running in the pitch black dark into the woods. Another girl in the group tripped and fell on a branch behind me. I turned to help her when we heard it. Several gunshots rang loudly from near the house and Mr S was yelling maniacally into the woods, you assholes think you're funny? Not so funny when I find you. We kept running, 
all crying, wheezing from the adrenaline and sped into the night towards the entrance of the driveway. When we were about to reach the entrance, we heard something even worse than gunshots. The sound of a diesel truck engine coming down the gravel driveway, slowly. We quickly went as deep into the woods as we could, without notifying him we were hiding, and stood silently with our hands over our mouths as not to make a noise. Mr S stopped his truck about 30 yards away and turned off his engine. It was totally silent. I could see him from where I stood and he had a shotgun over his shoulder as he walked towards the opposite side of the driveway, clearly looking and listening intently. In that moment, I truly thought we were going to be found and killed. No one except for B knew where we were. Our parents were all asleep. She was a mile down the road, oblivious, in her car, and I was trying desperately not to cry and sniffle in the silence. When I saw Mr S's shadow raising his shotgun into the air and firing around, I began to feel faint, truly thinking I was about to pass out from fear when I see car lights just up the road from the driveway, panicking. I wondered if the lights would illuminate us in the woods and give us away, but the car seemed to slow down, and I realised it was B. B rolled down her window and was talking loudly from her open car window, giving what I assumed were the police the address of Mr S's house. This made him angry, and he yelled and ran towards her car for a moment, then backed away cursing loudly and waving his gun into the air. As soon as Mr S began driving his truck back down the driveway towards his house, we sprinted full speed towards B's car and got in. We were crying hysterically, unable to speak, sweat pouring down us. No one said a word. We cried all the way back to T's house, showered and I could hear sniffles and crying all throughout the night into the morning. No one said a word about it to T or B's parents. No one even spoke about it amongst each other for years. We never went rolling again, to say the least. What had begun as a childish prank turned out to be one of the most horrifying experiences of my teenage years. Because we lived in the middle of nowhere and we had technically been vandalising someone's yard, B told us about a week later that she had faked the call with 911. It's still shocking to think about it. All I can say is we got lucky that night. Some angel somewhere was watching out for us. Looking back, B should have actually called 911. We were naive kids who were more afraid of getting in trouble than realising how at risk we were of being hurt or killed. Mr S, I don't know why you became so angry and violent. Just seeing toilet paper in your trees. But I hope I never see you again. <laughs>